We're going to open our Bibles today to the book of Romans, chapter 7. And I have just a few verses to read from there for you. To convey this idea that the Lord has placed in us throughout this series, which is a beautiful series. I don't know. How many of you are really starting to get the concept of it? It's just such a powerful thing. Amen. The book of Romans, chapter 7. And I'm going to read verse 15, 19, and then 21 through 23. And when you're ready with your devices, with your actual hard you know, copy Bibles, or with your eyes to look at the screen, just say amen. 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 Let us read the word of God. It reads, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says, I don't understand myself at all. For I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. It seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. It sounds like a confused and conflicted individual here. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another law at work within me that is at war with my mind. This law wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your mercy, God. I thank you for this beautiful opportunity, Lord God, to be able to address this amazing and, and wonderful congregation before me here, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you write your word into my heart, my mind, my soul, and my spirit, God. I pray that you speak to me today and work in my life today, Lord God. Excuse me one second, Lord. I want you guys to really make this prayer personal to you. I want you to really ask God to, to, to work in your life through his word today. I want you to really absorb not the words coming out of my mouth, but the words coming out of the, the, the book of life, the, the, the word of God today. Let us pray. Father, I, I just want to feel you near me. I want to get closer to you through your word, Lord. I want you to grow inside of me, Lord God. Raise me up out of my dark places, Lord God. Help me, Lord God. Shield me, Lord God, from all the things that want to come against me in this world, Lord God. Lord Jesus, I don't know sometimes how I'm going to get. I just feel cornered and boxed in sometimes, Lord God. But I pray, Lord God, today that you can help me experience the freedom of a God who fights my battles for me, Lord. Give me the trust, Lord God, that so many others I see have in you, Lord God. Lord Jesus, give me the courage and the bravery, Lord God. Lord, even the blessings. I wouldn't mind any blessings at all, Lord God, if you want to raise those, raise those down on me too, Lord Jesus. Above all else, Lord God, let your will be done in my life, Lord God. I give myself to you today. Let your will be done in my life, Lord God. I surrender to you today. Let your will be done in my life, Lord God. Whatever it is that you want to say to me, let your will be done in my life, Lord God. However you want to use me, whatever direction you want to lead me, Lord God, let your will be done in my life, Lord God. Right now, I tell you, let your will be done. Maybe later I'm going to say, take this cup from me, Lord God, but I'm telling you first. Nevertheless, your will be done in my life, Lord God, because I know that what you have for me is greater than anything I could ever imagine for myself, Lord God, and the direction you have for me is greater than anything I could have for myself, Lord God, and the power that you have for me is greater than anything I can exercise for myself, Lord God. Let your will be done in my life, Lord. Speak your word to me. Use me as your vessel for these people, Lord God. Pour forth through me to these people, Lord God. I have nothing for them. I'm useless to them, Lord, but you are everything, Lord God. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name, if you're ready, if you're finished praying, say amen. God bless you all. You may be seated in the house of God today. We are in the middle of an amazing series entitled One, um, The Secret to Overcoming All Odds. And it's a, just, uh, I mean, I know this, the concept of this series from start to finish. So I know it's a beautiful and amazing series. I know you guys have only got one week of it and a half, so... As this thing unfolds, you're just going to really get how powerful it truly is. But this series, one, seeks to, extend, seeks to expand on two concepts. Unity and God. When you think of one, you know, unity just, well, when I think of one as just a title or something, the word unity just comes into my mind. I don't know if that's the same for any of you. But then also when I think of one more than anything else, I think of God. Because we serve one God. And there is only one God in the, this universe. And, and there's only one way to experience, uh, you know, 
and eternity in his presence, and that's through this one God. And, and it's just amazing to think about, you know, I don't know how many of you guys, um, I was watching this movie the other day called Interstellar. Have you anybody seen that movie? It's this crazy movie about outer space and all this stuff and life on other planets and all that. Or people from Earth trying to find a planet to live on because Earth is going to be destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just amazing to think about the vastness of the universe that we live in. And then to, I mean, it, it, you can't even really imagine it, but the one God that created it all. And that one God makes himself available to us who are but dust to him. So I can't help when I think of, you know, the word one to think of the one God that we serve and his amazingness. Now this title, One, The Secret to Overcoming All Odds, uh, holds a promise to you. It holds a promise that you will learn a secret to overcoming all odds. Okay? Now as I was looking at this title, I started to look at the word odds. And the word odds comes from the mathematical study of probability. And this word, it's expressed in math as a ratio that something more likely will occur than something else. It's generally a term that's used in gambling or sports. For instance, uh, you would say the odds are two to one that, or yeah, two to one that the Yankees will win the World Series this year. <laughs> now to move on. <laughs> this is the spirit? No, I don't want to blaspheme at the altar. <laughs> when using the term odds, it is implied that the greater number of the ratio is the event that is favored to take place and the lesser number is therefore considered the underdog. So if you were, let's say, the Yankees, you would be considered the favorite. And if you were, say, the Mets, you would be considered the underdog. I get the chance to do that because I know Pastor Ezekiel is a, a Met fan. So it would normally be the other way around. <laughs> He's going to watch the video. <laughs> but as Pastor was saying last week, how many of you like to root for the underdog? Any... Anybody in here like to root from the underdog? I'm going to tell you why you like to root from the underdog. The reason why you like to root for the underdog is because we all have this subconscious desire to see ourselves succeed. And what I mean by that is because, and I'm going to give you a little secret here, because before we learn the secret to overcoming all odds, I'm going to teach you another little secret. We are all underdogs. You were born into this world with the odds stacked against you. Humanity as a species is not the favorite in the ratio. You see, our forebears, the progenitors of the human race, Adam and Eve, when they were created in this world, they were created as the favorites. They were God's personal favorite in creation. The Bible says that he didn't create them like he created all other things. It says that he took his time and shaped them with his own hands. And that he breathed his own spirit into them, the breath of life that created a living soul into them. And that, th that, that uh, aspect of creation was passed on to all humanity because we are all uh, created in the image of God. But at the time of Adam and Eve and their creation, they were created as God's favorites. But there was also an underdog that was out to battle against God's favorites. And back then when nobody was rooting for the underdog, unfortunately the underdog won the game. And this underdog that I'm talking about is Satan. Or as the Bible called him, that old serpent, the devil. Now let's see where they went wrong. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, Starting at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was the shrewdest of all the creatures the Lord God had made. Really, he asked the woman? Did God really say you must not eat any of the fruit in the garden? Of course we may eat it, the woman told him. It's only the fruit from the tree at the center of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God says we must not eat it 
or even touch it or we will die. The serpent hissed. God knows that your eyes will be open when you eat it. You'll become just like God, knowing everything, both good and evil. The woman was convinced. Wow, that was fast, huh? The fruit looked so fresh and delicious, and it would make her so wise. She ate some of the fruit. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Then he ate it too. Very simple story, right? Some of you might be saying there, what's the big deal about some fruit? It wasn't about the fruit at all. It was about the first command of the Lord not to eat it or touch it. Well, not to eat the fruit. I mean, the fruit was a big deal, the knowledge of good and evil, obviously. And they also had an option to eat of the tree of life, but they chose to do what God called them not to. And it wasn't as quick as we read here. Another version says that she considered it and it looked pleasing to the eyes and then she thought about how it might taste, that it would uh, you know, be desirable as food and then she began to think about the, the wisdom that it would impart into her life and it would make her more like God, which was her goal in the first place. And the, un, and the saddest thing about that is that humanity was never more like God than at that moment right there. And with all this considering... It didn't happen as fast as we read it here where he said, you're not going to die. And then she was convinced. No, there was some considering going on and there was some conflict going on and there was some fighting in the mind going on here. She gave in to her sin and Adam also with his conflict gave into it as well. You see, the battle is not about God versus Satan or even Satan versus man. It was about Eve's inner conflict and Adam's inner conflict and they both lost to no one but themselves. And ever since for all time, the odds were stacked against you. Not the odds that you would lose to Satan, that fight's over. The overdog, Satan became the underdog or the under serpent as in under Jesus' feet. But there's a, a... uh, another battle that is still taking place. And it's, it, it, it's a battle that some might say will be ongoing for the rest of your life. And in that battle, you have to decide are you going to be the favorite or the underdog. And with that, I want to introduce the title to my message. This message will be called Connect Four. Now, um, who likes to play Connect Four? Any? Fans of Connect Four? Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. Adi, come over here, Adi. You're going to help me out today. Have a seat right here. Let's uh, thank the Lord for Adi, who made it to a happy birthday this week. Good, have a seat. Looking all pretty today. This Adi's birthday was which day? Tuesday. Tuesday. How old did you turn? Ten. Ten. Wow, time is flying, huh? Thank Jesus for that. Permit me to sit down for a moment if I'm not going to mess up the shot. Are we good? Awesome. Great. What I have before me is this game called Connect Four. And me and Ariana are going to play this game. I hope the board is locked. I don't know. It doesn't look like it is. Was there like a, something missing? Yeah? Did it, was it not in the box? At any rate, I will move on with the explanation of this. So I have Ariana before me here, who is going to play Connect Four with me, provided we can find the last part (laughs) of this. But the way this game works is there's this grid, right? See the grid? And with this game and this grid, we have two opposing color checkers. Now the object of this game, let me see. Yeah, we definitely need a bottom part. (laughs) And the object of this game is to stack or otherwise line up four checkers in a row, either vertically, horizontally, or diagonally, anywhere in this grid as it is able to hold them up, which it's not currently able to do at this time. Maybe we're not going to play Connect Four. That's all right. Later we'll play Connect Four, okay? Now, most players, they don't get too strategically invested in a game like Connect Four, right? It's not like chess or, you know, risk or one of those other kind of, you know, what, what are the 
the big MMO games now that are out there that people would spend 20 hours a week, a day playing or something like that. You know, like uh, Call of Duty or some of those games that take a lot of thought and strategy and all that stuff. Um, most people don't get that kind of investment or give that kind of investment to a game like Connect 4. They stack the chips, the opponent stacks the chips, and what usually happens? One person loses attention or the other person gets lucky, right? And then boom, the game's over. Well, if you play that way against me, that's a big mistake because I get very strategically involved in a game like Connect 4. And the reason for that, uh, well, I can blame... <laughs> Awesome. I can blame Pastor Ezekiel for that because uh, me and Pastor Ezekiel uh, have been friends for 20 years. And when we were, uh, we young people, we used to play Connect Four quite often. And uh, the problem with that is that Pastor Ezekiel is very competitive. And I don't know where he got it from. He didn't grow up around guys. He grew up around his sisters, you know, and his cousins. They're all, all ladies. He didn't play, you know, a lot of sports as a child growing up. And uh, so... I don't know where this competitive streak <laughs> got into the guy, but he's very competitive. So he made Connect Four into an extremely competitive game. So I blame him for my strategic thinking in a game like Connect Four. Now, it doesn't matter how fast or slow you win the game. In the end, there's something that you all have to know. You will always only drop, as the winner, one more chip than your opponent. Did you guys get that? It doesn't matter how fast or slow it, or long it takes you to win the game, you will only drop one more chip than the person that you're playing against. It's not looking good? It's all good. <laughs> now, I call this sermon Connect Four because left as we are, this is how we fight. We'll drop a checker, our opponent will drop a checker, then we'll drop a checker, our opponent will drop a checker, then we'll drop a checker, our opponent will drop a checker, and we always leave space and room for the opponent to get between us, to infiltrate our strategy and never allow us to form a plan or formulate a method that will win the game for us. But when we're able to approach the board with a strategy, we not only can, but will win. So be warned. When we do play, I'm coming with a strategy. <laughs> you could go ahead and sit down. It's all right, bro. You guys get the point, right? Amen. Now, I want to look back at the scripture that we read in Romans chapter 7. And the Bible says, and this is the Apostle Paul writing here. Now, before I had commented that, it seemed like a very confused and conflicted individual. But this is the Apostle Paul writing here. He says, I don't understand myself at all. How many of you have ever felt that way? I don't understand myself at all. I don't understand myself at all. For I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Is he like speaking out of my mind? Is my brain like in his head while he's writing this? You see, instead I do the very thing I hate. When I want to do good, he goes on to say in verse 19, I don't. Has anyone ever felt this way? And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. Now it seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what, now he's saying this is a fact of life. When I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Even with the best intentions, I still do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another law at work within me. Now this guy is airing a very private inner conversation to centuries of humanity. How many of you guys in your most private, quiet moments have cried this thing out to the Lord or yelled at yourself this same statement? I want to do right. I want to follow the law of God, but there's another law at work within me that is at war with my mind. This law always seems to win the fight 
And at the end, I always feel like I'm a slave to the sin that is still within me. And if he was writing in modern times, he would have said, Lord, didn't it say in your word that I was free from sin? Didn't it say in your word that you defeated sin, that I wouldn't have to worry about it anymore? Anybody? It's amazing. And I'm talking about a fight here. This fight is not something that happens on the outside. He said this is a war with my mind. It's an inner conflict. And the question that I ask of you today, because the first thing that Satan did when he encountered Eve was he drove her to this same type of war, an inner conflict. So the question that I want to put forth to you right now is, what is there to gain from driving us to this inner conflict? Well, there is a method to the madness of Satan. And he knows that if he can get us to have an inner conflict, that inner conflict then becomes quickly outer conflict. You see, the Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? So now he's saying, what is causing you to fight against each other? He says, the inner conflict that you have inside of yourself is now becoming outer conflict between you and those around you. So the enemy knows if he can create an inner conflict within us, then that inner conflict will then extend to those in our circle, right? And if he can win there, if we can allow inner conflict to become outer conflict, then what's the next step in his process? Outer conflict then becomes discord in the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3 says, For you are still controlled by your own sinful desires. This is the same guy, Paul, who was just talking about being controlled by his own sinful desires, now admonishing other Christians for being controlled by their sinful desires. But this is what he goes on to say. And this is how we know that he was able to master his situation. He says, For you are jealous of one another and quarrel or fight with one another. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your own desires? You're acting like people who don't belong to the Lord. And then he goes on to say in the same book, 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, verses 17 and 18, he says, In the following directives I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Can you imagine coming into this place and us getting together is actually doing more harm than good? What does the church exist for? To make the world a better place, right? To go and share the love of Jesus, right? To get in here, get equipped, get empowered, and go out there and bring this amazing thing to those who don't have it. But because of the inner conflict that became outer conflict, now when we meet, we do more harm than good. It says, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, this is the saddest verse you will ever read in the Bible. There are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. I'll tell you right now, division is the death of the church. Amen. Why does it become easy for inner conflict to derail something as important as the ministry of the church? Because a conflicted individual is a defeated individual. The conflicted individual will always lose because a strategy cannot develop from inner conflicts. When we're too busy thinking about the war within ourselves, we don't have time to strategize how we're going to defeat things that are going on outside of ourselves. We become very self-centered, very self-centric. We become very uh, inner focused, very selfish. How many of you have spent more time today thinking about yourself than anything else that's going on around you? Look around you guys. So many people today spend so much time thinking about the hour they lost that they didn't even come to church. They weren't here to hear that anyway, so they're not offended. If they watch the video, maybe they'll get offended. 
It doesn't matter if every single person was filling up every chair in here, but if everybody was conflicted, then conflicted individuals cannot initiate a unity of purpose. So I'd rather have 10 not conflicted individuals forming a unity of purpose than 200 conflicted individuals sitting in the church. And I can tell you that a lot of these people are conflicted because if they weren't conflicted, they'd be here right now praising God. Not on vacation in Puerto Rico with Pastor Ezekiel. It seems like, no, not them, not Pastor Ezekiel. God knows that man needs a vacation. He's, yeah, he works. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about all the people that seem to have gone with them because there's nobody. Were, were they all on one plane? Uh, is that how it worked? I hope they watched the video. And if they cannot initiate a unity of purpose, and a mind full of conf conflict cannot create unity with God. Because we serve one God. And God creates one body. God is a God of unity and he unifies things. And if we are too busy dividing things within ourselves, then we don't allow room for God to enter in. And so if you want to create unity with God, a decision will have to be made and a stand will have to be taken. But the Bible says there will always be conflict between who I am and what God has done in me, right? It says there will always be a war. Well, the problem is not the existence of conflict. Every conflict will have a winner and a loser. If I would have played Connect Four, that conflict would have had a winner. No, nah, I'm just kidding. She probably would have beat me. It's been years since I played that game. The odds are against those least prepared to win. I'm just talking because she's not sitting there right now. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. But the odds are against those who are least prepared to win. And that is the problem with inner conflict, you see. Because we don't like to lose, right? How many of you like to lose? Raise your hand. None of us. Least of all, Pastor Ezekiel. He's the most competitive dude I ever met. No mercy, man. I remember when Danny was a little boy, he would not let him win a video game. <laughs> he, he said it himself. I'm not breaking any news here. All right? He said he had to teach the boy some hard lessons in life. That was his reasoning. Yeah, it's not because you're highly competitive and don't want to lose. But a lot of us are like that. Even, even those of us who are a little more gentler in our competition still don't like to lose, right? And so since we don't like to lose, we are, allow ourselves to fight ourselves in a continual struggle that generates neither a winner nor a loser and therefore does not end. Right? If you don't like to lose and you're fighting against yourself, there's, if there's a winner and a loser, then essentially you lose, right? Even if you win. You guys get my logic? I didn't throw anybody off with that. But all this circular fighting does is it, 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 it loses us the hidden battle. The one that we don't see, the battle for our souls. Now the question shouldn't be how can I win but lose? It should be what am I willing to lose to win. And Jesus always intended us to ask this question. He, in fact, put it forth to our contemplation early in his ministry when he said, will you gain the whole world to lose your soul? Today, I'm going to show you how to connect four ways to overcome the odds that this inner conflict will kill you. Because if it keeps going the way it is, odds are this inner conflict will kill you. But I'm going to give you four tools, show you how to connect four ways, four, not five, four ways to overcome the odds that this inner conflict will kill you. And the first way is this, objectivity. Now, I don't have slides for this, so you can't get lazy and take a picture. If you want to remember this, you're going to have to type it into your little notes app. All right? Objectivity. The first is objectivity. What that means is it means the ability to stand back and analyze your situation as though from the outside. You have to have an objective perspective, a third person point of view, so to speak. Look at your situation from the outside. 
Because if you're in the middle of it, sometimes it gets too personal for you. And the decisions that you make are out of passion rather than an analysis. And oftentimes when we make decisions like that, the decisions that we make are wrong and harmful to us. Am I talking to somebody in this place today? Am I the only one that has been here in this experience? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 21, it says, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth. Because many of us, if we stood back and looked at the situation objectively, then we know what God is trying to do in our lives, right? When we're going through things, when we're in the fire, we remember the verse that we are, you know, the, the, the fire purifies our patience, et cetera, et cetera, let patience have its perfect work in us, Right? But when we're in the fire, all we can think about is how much it burns, right? It says, I do not write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. If you're able to sit back and look at the truth of the matter, that God is not testing you so that you can die, but he's just holding you over the fire so you can be purified, then you will understand the truth of the matter is that God wants to bring you closer to him and get you stronger and bless you more, right? Right? Objectivity gives you the ability to see this. It gives you the ability to reflect and to make a decision free from the biases of your inner conflict. If we're talking about the war between the flesh and the spirit, you have one bias that wants to do all the things in the desires of your heart and one bias that wants to follow God in its extreme. And if you had to lose to one bias, I would take this one every time because this is the bias that's going to gain you victory in eternity. But oftentimes we follow this bias and we... But if you can stand back, you look at the two sides of the conflict, then you always pick the correct side. It doesn't feel like the winning side when you're in the middle of it, right? When temptation is hitting you hard, it doesn't feel like the winning side, right? When you can't get that thing off of your mind... Sometimes it feels like the winning side would be to just satisfy that desire. But if you can look at things objectively, then you can overcome. And one of my favorite ways to gain objectivity is to pray. Truly pray to God. Not for things. Not God bless me with this or God give me that. But to actually pray just to communicate. Because when in this state, you know true objectivity. Even though the experience could not be more personal, it's almost like sitting back and looking at yourself in the spirit. You see yourself, you see how unholy, how unworthy you are, sitting there before the throne of the Most High God, the King of the universe, this righteous Lord who is, you know, perfect in every way, and you understand that you don't belong by His side, but by His sacrifice, He opened the way to His presence for you and me. No matter what evil we carry in us. And when you are able to look at yourself that way, the whole universe, the, your perspective about everything in this world changes. You don't think about yourself as so weak anymore when you're able to look at the God who's on your side. Because the Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen? So, checker number one, objectivity. Checker number two, willpower. Sometimes the only way to gain objectivity is by sheer force of will. When our will is strong, our decisions are not influenced by our feelings, but by our discipline. It's a tough word, right? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, it says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Now it's amazing that what my body should do, it needs to be trained to do. I can't, I can't go into that because that's a whole other message. But it's crazy. My body should do something, but it won't do it until it's trained to do so. My body was created and formed to do something, but it doesn't do it unless it's disciplined to do so. 
And without that discipline, my body will always lose at its task. Without that willpower, that discipline, without me consciously making an effort to force myself to do what I should do, I will never do it and I will lose. It says, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Wouldn't that be a sad thing? You're an exercise coach and you spend 10 years training people to lose weight and feel good about themselves and then you kill yourself because of low self-esteem issues? These are, this is real. This stuff happens out there because we allow ourselves to be overtaken not by our discipline but by our feelings. How many of you have ever told yourself, I got to follow my heart. Follow my heart. Just follow what the heart tells you. Basically, you're saying you got to follow your feelings, right? From now on, every day, I'm going to follow where my heart leads me, right? Intellectually, you know, if you don't wake up and go to work, you're not going to get paid. You're going to lose your house, right? But I don't feel like going to work today. (laughs) Well, guess what? Your heart has to cut out and your discipline has to kick in. Discipline. Willpower. This is the way to bring objectivity into your life. Because when it gets personal, when you're in the middle of conflict, you don't really think about these things objectively. You have to be trained to battle. That's why soldiers go through... uh, they go through basic training. It's the boot camp. It, 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 it allows them not to think, but just to react. To do what they're supposed to do in the middle of a situation that they would become overwhelmed in and not be able to function in if they thought about what they were supposed to do before they acted. Some of us need some discipline. Some of us need some training in our lives. Some of us need some Christian training in our lives. Some of us don't go home and read the Bible when we're not in church. Some of us only get the two scriptures that we put up on Sundays when the the pastor's preaching. And they don't go home and do any spiritual feeding of their own selves. Let me not jump ahead. Let me not offend anyone either. Checker number one, objectivity. Checker number two, willpower. You know, you can't even get to checker number one without checker number two. The checker number three, surrender. Surrender, you're talking about conflict. Surrender means giving up. Well, I'm not talking about surrendering in the conflict that is inside of yourself. I'm talking about surrender to God. You guys got to understand what surrender to God truly means. Some of us here have not fully surrendered to God and don't really know what that means. To surrender to God means you're willing to give everything or do anything for the will of God to to have his way in this world. Through you, in you, whatever it takes. Have you ever said to yourself or, you know, got down and prayed to God and said, Lord, I want your will to be done in my life. I give myself to you. Do you understand what that means? I thought I understood what it meant seven years ago before we started this church. I thought I understood what it meant before the Lord asked me to leave my family behind and my job and come out here to a place where I didn't know anybody. I had nowhere to live, no car to drive, no job to work at, no money saved to make it, no church to go to. We started this church with five people in the living room. And I'm going to blame it on daylight savings time. It almost looks like we went back there. (laughs) But... We're far from the living room days. Not because of anything we were doing, but because we said to God, have your way in our lives, and he did. And I have seen hundreds, thousands of lives impacted with the word of God throughout these seven years that was able to work for him because of the simple act of surrender. If you want to do great things in your life, greater things than you ever could have imagined yourself doing, It's going to take some surrender to God. 
It doesn't matter how strong-willed you are, though. If you're operating in your own strength, you're never going to win the battle. You're never going to get anywhere. You're never going to be able to accomplish what God has for you to do. You need to surrender to him so that he can operate through you. Because the conflict will stop being between you and yourself and it will start being between your will and God's will. God wants you to do this, but you want to do that. How many of you are in school right now, college? Can you imagine saying to God, you know what, Lord? I give up this career goal that I have and I want your will to be done. Yeah, I have been studying two years, three years, some of us five years. But you know what? I give that up right now, whatever. If you want me to change majors right now, Some of y'all are like, shoot. Right? Could you you truly surrender to God? You see, it can work against you as you resist God. Because God has great things for you. There's not a single person in this place, I'm going to tell you right now, who doesn't have a great purpose. There's not a single one of you sitting in any of these chairs that God has not called to great things. He hasn't, he hasn't chosen you. He hasn't chosen you, Robert, and said, you're going to sit in my church and be comfortable in your chair for the rest of your life and you're going to just experience the Sunday service and amen. He chose you and said, Robert, you're going to be a king in my castle. You're going to be an amazing man of God and you're going to change many lives. Each and every one of you guys, he has spoken a word over. He has, has created you for greatness. Yes, amen. And it, the only thing between you and the greatness that God has for you is your your willingness to surrender. That's it. Some of you right now are probably asking yourselves, why can't God use me if he's using that nutcase up there? I promise I wasn't going to say anything ratchet. <laughs> that is the last thing I'll say. God can use you if you can surrender to him, if you can give yourself into his hands. Amen? The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 10, says, when you bow down before the Lord and admit your dependence on him, he will lift you up and give you honor. There's no greater honor than the honor that God can give you. There's no higher lifting up than the lifting up that God can bring you to. Those sleep deprivation. There's no greater heights than the heights that God can bring you to is what I meant to say there. Okay? You think that you can get yourself to some heights through your own strength? Imagine the strength and power of the almighty God of the universe and how high he can bring you. And each of you are meant to get there. Surrender. Bring yourself low before God so that he can bring you up before this world. Amen? And the last checker, the one that will give you connect for. The winning piece, that's right. Spiritual development. Spiritual development. Spiritual development. Did I say anything too complicated for anybody today? Objectivity, willpower, surrender to God, and spiritual development. What is spiritual development, Pastor? I'm kind of new to this thing. Well, spiritual development means expanding on your relationship with God. And how do we do that? Somebody shout out a way to get yourself spiritually developed. Praying, reading the Bible. Oh my God, those are complicated. Wait, hold on, we're getting too crazy now. Worship, oh no. We already do that on Sunday mornings. Might as well just do it in the rest of it. Some of y'all do it in the shower. Some of y'all do it when you're driving, right? (laughs) Make it real. Yes. God is able to meet you in your car, okay? Yes, he is. He says where two and three are gathered. And some of y'all sound like 10 people screaming. So yeah, you don't want to hear me singing. I always joke that if I sang in the church, then the Lord would leave me behind in the rapture because you all would lose your salvation. So spiritual development is simple. All you got to do is work on your relationship with God and all of this other stuff comes together. That's the winning piece. Work on your relationship with God. Why? Because if you work on your relationship with God, if you get to know this God of the universe and who he is and what he has for you and what he wants to do in your life, then surrendering to him becomes easy because you know that what he has for you is greater than what you have for yourself. And if surrendering to him becomes easy, then it becomes easy to be strong in your will because the spirit of God that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And if having a strong will by the spirit of God is something that you are able to do, 
then you are able to now step outside of the box of this craziness that you're going through and look at it objectively and say, you know what? This is a tough situation, but God got me through the last one and he's damn sure going to get me through this one. Right? It, it might be tough now, but if you remember something, to touch yourself, oh, wait, I'm still here. I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. Oh, my God. I thought I was not going to make it through that last one, but hey, I'm sitting here today because God got me through it. And if he was able to get me through that one, I know he's able to get me through this one. And you can only tell yourself that through this objectivity. If you don't have it, you're sitting there saying, man, I'm going to die. How am I going to get over this? Ask me in a year if you died. If you died, don't ask me in a year. All right? A spiritual dem- <laughs> For those of you who do make it. <laughs> With God, I can guarantee you that you're going to make it if it's in his will. Amen. If it's not, then you go on to greater things. Amen. Some of us would rather do that than make it, right? <laughs> the Bible... <laughs> Sorry. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm an amateur. I can't stop laughing sometimes. Second Corinthians chapter 10 says in verses 4 and 5, and talking about spiritual development. Because we're talking about a battle, right? We're talking about a conflict, right? So what, does spirit, what kind of weapons does spiritual development give me? Well, the Bible says in Second Corinthians chapter 10 in verses 4 and 5, it says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, right? You have inner conflict with yourself. What kind of weapons do you try to fight with? Not the weapons of the world. Now, the author of this is thinking of swords and shields and spears, right? Actual physical weapons. But what other weapons do we use today that are weapons of the world? Psychiatry, medication, okay? Sometimes the battle is not about those things. Sometimes inner conflict cannot be solved with Ritalin or Oxycontin or cocaine, or just talking to somebody. Sometimes the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And even though the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or conventional, and if you told your psychiatrist that spiritual development might get you through this inner conflict, he might look at you like you're crazy. On the contrary, they do have divine power to demolish strongholds in your life. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Sometimes the biggest problem is that we don't know how to take our thoughts captive and they run wild in our minds. We try to do the right thing and the good that we want to do, we don't do it because the thoughts that come into our mind seem too powerful and we can't overcome them. Well, the Bible says you have power. You have tools and you have weapons to take those thoughts captive and to subject them under the knowledge of Christ. What is it telling you? What's the knowledge of Christ? What brings you the knowledge of Christ? The Word of God. So if you're not filling your, if you're not developing yourself spiritually by the Word of God, then guess what? You are not empowered to take these thoughts captive and they're able to run wild in you and they're able to overcome in this inner conflict. It's spiritual development that brings it all together, that brings it all home. It's empowering yourself through the Word of God. The Bible says the Word of God is your sword. That's your chief weapon, okay? If you were nowadays, the Word of God would be whatever is the craziest, largest, most destructive weapon that we have, okay? Because the Word of God can destroy anything evil that comes against you if you use it. The reason why we lose our battles is because we don't use the word of God the way it was intended to be used. It is something that we take in. It's something that we eat. The Bible says that the word is God. So if you have the word in you, then you have God in you. And if you speak the word, then you're speaking God. And if you're using the word to overcome evil, then you're using God to overcome evil. And once again, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen? So, as I said, I don't want to take too much of your time. I'm going to finish with this. The truth of the matter is, the odds are stacked against us. So what if the odds are stacked against us? 
do you know that betting odds are determined less by the fact or condition of, event, of an event than by the majority of who choose the likeliness of it over others? In other words, if something is 100 to 1, it just means that more people are betting that that thing will win than the other thing. They might be looking at the condition of something, maybe from the outside of what it looks like on the outside. But you never know what can truly win the battle until the battle is over. So yeah, the odds are stacked against you. Yeah, everyone might look at you like you're a failure. And yeah, everyone might judge you based on where you came from. And yeah, everyone might judge you based on what you did. And yeah, to them you're worth nothing. And yeah, to them you're going nowhere. And yeah, to them you're never going to overcome. And yeah, to them you're just the underdog. But you know what? You know who's rooting for the underdog? Jesus Christ is rooting for the underdog. Because though the odds, based on what everything else looks like, might be against you, you're still God's favorites. You're still God's favorites. Because the things that are not seen are more real than what's seen. And when he looks at you, he sees his hidden spirit working to help you see things analytically, to empower you, to give you strength of will through your surrender to him and his equipping of you through your preparation with all the tools of his unending power. You are the favorite and the battle is already won. Amen? Amen? You are God's favorite and the battle is already won. You have the victory. What are you stressing for? Surrender. Proclaim it. Own it for yourself. I have the victory in the name of Jesus.